All right, welcome everyone. My name is Alexis Bateman and I'm a research scientist with the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics and a course lead for the MicroMasters program in, in supply chain management. And we are really lucky to have two excellent speakers today. We have our very own Dr. Ava Ponce, the executive director of the MicroMasters program at SCM and the director of the Omnichannel Supply Chain Lab, as well as Mr. Dan Covert, the director of supply chain R&D of Retail Business Services and a hold De La Hayes company, and also an MIT SEM Masters alum. We're really excited to have them both for our great session today on the future of Omnichannel e-grocery. So not a lot of topics that uh, uh, everyone is not familiar with these days, but one right now that is very relevant and we're really excited to explore today. Thank you both for joining. Thank you, Alexis, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Excited to be here. Great. All right. Uh, so I'll just briefly go through the agenda today and then we're going to dive right in because I know we have a lot to explore today. So the agenda of the session will be that Ava and I will kick off very briefly an intro into the context of Omnichannel eGrocery and, and just set some of the scene, uh, answer some preliminary questions, and we can dive right into talking to Ava and Dan with all our, our burning questions uh, and really how eGrocery has evolved amidst the uh, pandemic as well as some key trends uh, and how the industry is responding. Uh, I'll ask Dan and Ava some questions I pulled uh, from crowdsourced questions from yourself. And of course, uh, please start submitting questions as we go along into the Q&A box. There's a specific Q&A box, not the chat. Uh, at the end of the discussion, we'll have a chance for those questions. And uh, Please be make sure. Please be sure to be logged in with a name. We won't be asking any anonymous uh, questions, so just be sure to have that. Uh, we'll also share a couple polls. It'll pop up on your screen, so uh, it'll just make the discussion more dynamic. And really uh, look forward to your your feedback. We'll be able to see some real time results. So why don't we just uh, start with our brief presentation, Ava? And uh, I will uh, let you kick it away. But in the meantime, as you guys are thinking about Q&A, don't forget to put it in the Q&A box. Excellent. Thank you, Alexis. So yes, we are talking today about the future of omnichannel e grocery. Um, first of all, I want to highlight some of the key trends that are affecting many retailers and in particularly, in particularly a grocery and e-grocery retailers. So the first uh, trend I want to mention here is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the pandemic definitely has accelerated the need of more and the growth of digital and e-commerce. This growth of e-commerce started some years ago, and in the last decade, we have observed this increase of e-commerce sales. However, the pandemic has accelerated this trend, and more specifically in the e-grocery industry. The second trend I want to mention here is the increase of in consumer expectations. And this is also another thing that is particularly relevant in the e-grocery industry. About the 70% of customers identified faster home delivery as their main expectation from retail stores. And this, uh, at the end, for the supply chain, is a big challenge, and supply chains need to be ready to meet these customer expectations. And the third thing I want to mention here is the change in consumers' behavior. Again, this is something that started um, in 2007 when Apple announced the first smartphone, the first iPhone. Since then, almost more than half of the population has a smartphone and also access to internet. And this allow everyone to almost buy from anywhere. This is an important uh, change in consumers' behavior. And we have that about 70% of all shopping events start online with customers exploring options from their personal devices, smartphones, tablets, iPads, any of those personal devices. Um, in terms of the numbers, we have that the online retailing represents about 12% in the United States of the total retail sales that, that um, 
we, we have uh, in the US. In Europe, this percentage is about 17%. And in China, it's even higher. It's about 24%. So it's, it's definitely a growing and a relevant percentage of the total retail sales of consumer goods. Here is more detailed numbers, and I want to bring here the impact of the pandemic on this growth, on the growth of e-commerce in general in the retail landscape. In the US, e-commerce sales increased from 2019 to 2020 in about 15%. The total retail sales increased in about 6%, and the web penetration currently is about 16%. And as I mentioned before, in China is even higher. 24% of the total retail sales of consumer goods are online retailing. And this is a, an increase in comparison with the 2019 data of about 5%. So this is a kind of the general picture here. And Alexis now is going to talk more specifically about the impact on the e-grocery industry. So Alexis, the floor is yours. Sure, uh, just briefly. So why e-grocery? Why are we talking about grocery in particular amidst all the different different changes in e-commerce e in general? And so one reason is really just the a, a huge uptick in adoptions and what that's going to look like going forward. So you can see some analysis done by a group, Mercatus, uh, on e-grocery. And you can see here, 2018, 2019, we have about 2.7%, 3.7% of sales going through e-grocery channels. And here we are, 2020 jumps up to 102 two percent on average and at certain points this year it was much much higher uh it's leveled off over the summer a little bit but the projections go significantly up and and we'll see what that looks like even into 2021 as the as the pandemic continues so some really interesting uh adoption uh as well as the fact that grocery and and dan will speak to this much uh, more significantly today because he, he's in the industry sector is that food retailing grocery on the whole increased significantly during the start of the pandemic. People were reallocating their dollars and their calories to uh, food retailing over uh, what they would have possibly spent at, at supermarkets and other outlets. And so the actual demand went significantly up and that had to land somewhere. Uh, just click again, as well as the actual number of e-grocery orders in the early uh, months. Uh, and this is, this is US data, but it, it held true in other parts of the world and maybe was even more pronounced in certain parts of the world. But e-grocery orders actually increased 300% at the start of the pandemic. So a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, innovation needed to happen very, very quickly. And we'll talk more about that later. But why in particular is e-grocery different from other e-commerce? One is uh, high levels of perishability. So the need to move the goods, uh, uh, turn them over and uh, manage so that they don't spoil and they reach consumers ho homes in a certain fashion or are able to be collected uh, and so that they're not spoiled. Uh, they're also, uh, the, the industry is also, uh, the uh, consumer expectation of rapid fulfillment and speed is even higher than other sectors of e-commerce. You know, for instance, you want your groceries in two hours, but you may be willing to wait for other products a little bit longer. Uh, there really isn't as much a, a return segment than there are in other industries, as well as food is a basic human needs. So there's a little bit more of an emotive factor here. It's not, of course, there are many emotive factors for many products, but but food is something you need to, to live and for your families to thrive. And we'll go to the next slide. And so we'll just br briefly present some uh, research that we did with uh, HLab. Ava and I conduct, helped conduct a survey on to gauge how grocery shopping was evolving during uh, the, the COVID pandemic. And this happened actually, this data was collected in May and June of this year. It's a US consumer market panel survey. And you can see the distribution, uh, excuse me, the, the breakdown of where people were shopping pre-pandemic on the left, which was 82% said that they were buying it in the store and about 13% said that they would uh, you know, have it delivered to their home. Whereas you look over to the right, which is during COVID, actually that shifts quite significantly. So 57% we're shopping in the store, 57.5, and then 31% having it delivered to the home and some other uh, channels, either someone will shop for them or they picked it up uh, at the store and or, uh, or had other options. So some interesting uh, changes there. So, but the even more interesting question that we'll be exploring today is how many people will stay with that choice once we go back to normal, whatever normal is. 
Uh, so what we found was that, uh, you know, about 30% of the surveyed uh, market panels changed the way that they received groceries. So they either went to store to pick up or to delivery to home. Uh, and then 61% say they will go back to normal on, on whatever normal is. And then actually a third of the sample said they will stay uh, with their change choice. So that has implications since so many shifted to e-grocery and, and why we want to talk about it today. Back to you, Eva. Excellent. Thank you, Alexis. Um, yes, the finally, what I want to talk uh, before we start uh, with the panel is about omnichannel strategies and the hybrid models. Um, I, I just want to summary, uh, present a summary of, of these different strategies in omnichannel in this chart. I'm including here the two, two relevant um, aspects, information and fulfillment. So traditional retailers uh, belongs to that quadrant. When we uh, deliver the information in the store and when the, the customers go to the store and buy and grab and go, grab the product and go with the product. Pure players are those who are offering all of the information online, but of, uh, in terms of the delivery, they are sending directly to your home. And this is where Amazon in 1995 were. They started as a 100% pure player. Nowadays, currently, what we are observing is a lot of hybrid models. What we have is basically traditional brick and mortars offering the, the option for the customers to buy online and pick up in the store. Many and many click and collect uh, um, models are rolling out and there are many examples of that. Walmart, Target, Al Alhol Del Hayes Group, all of them are rolling this click and collect model, offering their customers to buy online, to go to the store, to pick up their online order. There are also new business models like showrooms. These are um, stores that offer the opportunity to their customers to go to touch the, the products, to try their products, but they cannot buy from the store. They need to buy online and receive at home. So these are new business models that are also uh, ha happening now based on this situation. And finally, what I want to bring here is that we don't have any more pure players like Amazon when they started in 1995. We don't have any more pure traditional 100% brick and mortars only offering an offline or in-person experience. What we have now is these hybrid models, many different channels, many different options to our customers. And from the retailer's perspective, they need to manage these different channels and these different options. And this is what we are going to discuss today with our industry speaker too. So that's all from my side. Alexis, come back to you. Great. Okay. Well, so hopefully that set the scene and, and now we'll dive right in. But first, we'll kick off a poll just so we have uh, some real-time results for all of you. So if you can uh, fill this out to the best of your ability, and then we will discuss the results uh, after we, we kick it off with Ava and Dan. So let, let's get started then. Uh, one of the first questions and one that I grabbed from uh, someone who submitted it earlier, which is really what are the main impacts that COVID-19 has had on the grocery industry in general? I will start, oh, Alex. Sorry, I'll, I'll yes. allocate. I'll say yes. Ava Dan. So. <laughs> yes, okay, perfect. So I think that the pandemic has accelerated the need of omnichannel groceries. Customers move to grocery pickup and home delivery, and retailers need to provide more options, more choices, more channels to their customers, and more capacity to prepare online orders. And at the same time, they need to be able to provide a seamless experience to their customers through the different channels. And this is not an easy task at all. The second thing I, I think that COVID-19 has impacted in, in this industry is the digital disruptions on retail strategies. Many different digital disruptions, Internet of Things, Big Data Analytics, uh, Artificial Intelligence, Predictive Analytics, and also the innovation in technology. Um, automation is key here, is key for picking, for prepare the online orders and for packing orders too. And to keep, in order to keep this fulfillment cost 
down. This is one, one important thing in this industry. And also in order to be able to provide this seamless and more rich experience online and in person to their customer. That is something that customers are demanding. And the third thing I want to bring here is um, also retailers, uh, in particular in the grocery industry, they need to explore new business models to stay relevant. They need to reimagine the experience they want to offer in person, in the store. Some retailers are considering omni stores. This is a mix of in-store and virtual experience. Omni stores refers to that offer that the customer can go and buy something in person. Sometimes customers prefer to buy the fresh foods and fresh products in person. There are also spontaneous buying that occur and this happen in person. And at the same time, these are the stores that are able to prepare your online order in the warehouses. Some of these stores, based on the use of automation, are using microphone fulfillment centers just to prepare this online order uh, very fast for these online customers. So I think these are some of the main things that are impacting this industry. Dan, your thoughts? All right, great. Thanks, Alexis. And thanks, Eva, for the for the comments and the nice presentation. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's been sort of a, a wild year in, in the food retail business, I think. The, the numbers you showed, you know, 20% growth, we saw 127% e-commerce growth in the first quarter or in the second quarter of this year, which is not something that we've really planned for. I mean, in the food retail business, you know, it's not, you have big spikes in demand throughout the year and Thanksgiving, Christmas, and those happen at the same time every year, but the pandemic doesn't happen at the same time every year, fortunately. So really what one of the big challenges we've seen is just how do you, how do you respond to this quickly? because you can plan all year for Christmas, you, but this happened like pretty much overnight. I mean, I think, you know, March 12th is sort of the date that we all have in our heads that, you know, everything was fine. And then we came into work the next day and our sales were up 180% the previous day. And that was not something that, that anybody planned for. So I think really, really two, two big impacts that we think about is how do we be more flexible in our supply chain design and, and more resilient because I think what we're seeing is, is a huge need for flexibility. And when demand is very unpredictable, you know, we've talked a lot about insurance and a lot of the courses, you spend a lot of time on forecasting and how do you accurately predict demand? This is not something that you've got a data set for. So it's, it becomes less the focus on the sort of math. How do we accurately forecast what we're going to sell and just how do we build flexibility in? So a lot of, a lot of what we've seen in the early days of the pandemic was just how do we get product out to our stores? You can't triple the size of your warehouse overnight. You can't bring in three times more people to move the same volume. So how do you efficiently do that? So think about a couple different strategies. You know, how do we ship more calories per truck? How do we more efficiently handle product? So are we, are we shifting from full case or each pick to, to full pallet? Are we, are we shipping mixed pallets? Are we working with suppliers to get mixed pallets right into our warehouses that we can cross stock straight to our store. So eliminating the, the amount of touches that have to happen on, on a product level is a really efficient way to get more product out with the same labor. So that becomes really the big challenge that, that we've been focusing on is, you know, how do we shift more product with the same amount of labor with the same size of warehouse? How do we work with other suppliers? So people have, are still eating the same amount. They're just shopping different channels. You know, restaurants were closed for a long time. So everybody's getting all of their food from grocery stores, which means that, that you know, we use this uh, metaphor or metric share of stomach in the grocery business and talking about how, much, how many calories are being purchased from our stores versus from a restaurant. And, and that increased dramatically. So it's, we now have new suppliers so we can get product from us foods from cisco from these big restaurant suppliers how do we quickly integrate new suppliers into our supply chain when you know all of our our traditional suppliers were you know, at the bursting at the seams with demand but now we have this other um this other source of supply that we can integrate so that that was certainly one big thing how do we be flexible and manage capacity and then to kind of the point that we started on how do we scale e-commerce incredibly fast that was something that you know we'd been talking about for for years, and we knew that this was coming. And 
you know, two, 3% growth year over year, you know, maybe 15% growth is a great year, but you know, a hundred percent growth is not something you plan for. So there, this requires a lot of, a lot of different thinking and, you know, what's the quickest way to scale capacity. And when we, when we started, you know, we had a lot of click and collect stores and uh, click and collect points. And we shut a lot of that down just so we could get more product out to our customers through our stores. And then we've had to quickly ramp that up. I think we had plans to be at 600 click and collect points by the end of the year, we're going to be at 1100 now. So really quickly accelerating that has been you know, one of the main focuses. So it's, it's sort of those two things. How do we manage traditional brick and mortar capacity? And then how do we find new channels to get product to our customers and sort of scale on the technology side and make that experience as, as seamless as possible? Super interesting. Thanks for that. And those of you guys that are in SE3X just starting the risk week are going to see some of those exact terms that Dan was talking about in terms of building and flex flexibility and, and planning for the unplannable, which, uh, you know, I don't think anyone could have expected COVID, but, you know, in the ways that you can do some preparation. Uh, and other things that maybe you guys can touch on when we go to the next question is some of the, the terms, right? So click collect, if some of you guys aren't familiar, is where you buy it online and then pick it up in a store. Maybe everyone's familiar, but, you know, all those terms are evolving and being adopted very, very quickly. Um, so let's just look to our, our first poll and see what you guys said. So the, the question was, how has the growth of e-commerce impacted your supply chain, if at all? And so the top answer was uh, more pressure on business to consumer and last mile deliveries. And the second most uh, common answer was speeding up deliveries for faster shipping times, while the fewest of you said, said, the increasing the number of returns. So that makes sense. Not a lot of people returning sandwiches. Uh, so any thoughts on this, uh, you guys, uh, Ava, on the poll? Yes, definitely. I, 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 I'm with them. One of the main challenges that we hear for all of our partners at MIT, the Center for Transportation and Logistics, is about this more pressure about business to consumer and last mile delivery. Last mile delivery is representing a big chunk of the total logistic cost when we are talking about e-commerce. So definitely is one of the challenges. Um, the, the second one, they, ah, and they also mentioned, and I like this one, shaping the omni-channel strategy for the organization. And I can tell you that most of the companies we are interacting with, the first question is, hey, we are now in the middle of defining, implementing our omni-channel strategy and facing all of the challenges associated to that. So yeah. Great responses. Thank you for participating. Yeah. Great. yeah, I definitely definitely agree with with that response. I mean, the last mile delivery has become so important because I, I think what we've a lot of similar retailers to us, the, the way you scale e-commerce quickly is through click and collect because you have existing infrastructure, you have selectors and you have people that already work in the store and that's an easy way to get your, to dip your toe in the water. And that is a sort of low risk, low capital way to get into e-commerce. And that has sort of been the predominant method is order online, pick up in store, very infrastructure light, very quick to scale. And now with, with the pandemic, there's been a lot more of a push to home delivery, to order online, get it delivered to your house. And the ability to scale that quickly is much more challenging because now you're adding a logistics component into that. And so there's tremendous pressure that we've, we've felt in that space and you know going from that that model to now we have to have a logistics component to this, which requires, you know, maybe doing selection in store isn't as viable of an option to then have transportation fleet leaving every store to go to people's homes. So that leads to more things like central fulfillment, which really, I think that that dovetails quite well with the strategy is that you, you sort of start with, okay, how do we start to play in this space? Meaning how do we dip our toe in the water? It's order online, pick up in store, and then, okay, this is really growing quite quickly. Now we have to start thinking strategically about this. So that, that is not just fulfillment method, but it becomes network design as well. So where do we put central fulfillment centers? Where do we, do, do we distribute from full case to break pack to customer? Do we go straight from manufacturers to customers? Like what are all of the different fulfillment strategies when home delivery becomes so important? That really makes the, a company like ours, we're spending a lot of time thinking about what's the whole strategy, not just... What's our brick and mortar full case strategy? What's how do we get product to customers? But how do we integrate both of those and really think about the supply chain differently so that we can serve really through any channel with the same efficiency? Great. 
Awesome. So I think we actually skipped on to uh, the next question I was about to ask, which is what are the key capabilities and capacities that industry had to grow and or develop to deal with these changes? So I think we touched on that, but um, also I'm a, I'm a guilty committer, but uh, some learners are saying that we're speaking too fast. I think you're doing just fine, Dan. I believe it's me. So we'll try to <laughs> slow down a little bit, a little too much coffee already this morning. Uh, so uh, based on that, I think we did touch on some of the points about how industry is changing. Anything else to add you didn't already say, Dan, and then we'll jump over to you, Ava. Yeah, I think I think just just one thing to add and sort of, you know, an example from from our company is is really the, the control of the supply chain. So we're in in addition to sort of the, the biggest sales that we've ever seen, we're also going through sort of a strategic transformation where we're integrating our, our full supply chain. So I'll hold delays USA is the product of a merger between I'll hold and delays, which had two different supply chain strategies. One was sort of outsourced to CNS on the I'll hold side. And then the other one was insourced um, on the delay side. So we owned our warehouses and did all of that. And now we're moving towards one fully integrated supply chain, which I think sort of to the point around network strategy, this helps us think we have to think a lot differently around how the network is designed. It's not just, you know, what's the shortest distance to stores. Now it's where are customers located and what's the shortest distance to customers houses and how do we design a network so that, you know, traditional brick and mortar supply chain, you might have, you know, slow mover warehouse, fast mover warehouse, break pack, full case, um, sort of respectively. But now it's, do we need to have regional hubs? Is it more of a, a hub and spoke network design model where we being really close to the customer is super important and not just being close to stores and having, you know, daily fulfillments from distribution centers. Can we do two hour fulfillment because we have a central distribution hub really close to our customer. And I think that that's, that's really a core capability. And then sort of on the back end of this is like the orchestration layer of this, when you add this sort of node complexity to your supply chain becomes an incredible challenge. And that's managing all the data between demand management, logistics, operations, fulfillment. How do you sort of put an orchestration layer on top of that? So that that's sort of control tower is kind of the industry term behind that. And we've been spending a lot of time figuring out how you integrate all of that so that we know, hey, if a truck is gonna be late, then these are my options to make sure that I can still get product, can still product promise the right product to my customers through the e-commerce channel. I can still get it to my stores for a promotion. That that flexibility, that the visibility that a control tower creates is, is really critical to being able to serve all of these different channels. Great, thanks. And as a strategy r and I'm guessing a lot of that is falling in your lap. So sounds like a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely fun. Uh, Ava, anything to add to, to what Dan yes. said? I, I fully agree with Dan that one of the key capabilities here that the industry need to build is flexibility. Flexibility to be able to adapt to changes in the demand. And this surge of e-commerce that has been caused by the pandemic has, been, has accelerated this need of flexible warehouses that are all, uh, need also to be closer to the end customer. So um, um, technology, technology, I think is something that companies need to rely on and need to use in order to fulfill, to, to build this capability. Solutions like micro fulfillment centers, I, I think are becoming more and more popular because they are combining this space saving uh, thing that is very relevant now. And also the, um, the good thing that automation provide here in order to be able to provide faster deliveries. That is an or, another request or another uh, customer expectation we need to, to meet. The, to have a dynamic fulfillment operations, a dynamic way to fulfill these uh, online orders. And finally, uh, also the capability to develop a good plan for risk management. This unprecedented time, definitely those companies that has being able to manage the peak of, of the demand, the lockdowns, the re reduction of the labor workforce due, due also to the pandemic are also things that companies need to be very uh, prepared, um, need to be resilient. And I, 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 I'm sure that Dan is going to talk more and more about that. Um, in our courses, you also have a scenario planning as a tool to help you to predict this <laughs> unforeseen future <laughs> that uh, might also be very helpful. Yeah. 
Yeah, great. And for those of you guys, again, that are SC3X, and if you aren't in it, you should definitely take it because so many of these topics, along with uh, all of our courses we're, we're talking about today, but scenario planning in week three is a, is a great tool to apply here. Um, so let's jump to our, our next poll. Uh, so we will um, go to our next poll. So if you guys can fill it out and then we'll discuss it after this next question. Uh, so this is, uh, we'll start with Dan on this one again. Uh, how is the the stickiness, which, is, you know, sort of a, a, a term that maybe you can explain as well, changed behaviors during this uh, time of grocery ind industry's future strategy. So uh, for, for consumers, the stickiness of their behavior and how is that being prepared for uh, ongoing changes to demand? And one more kind of added thing, that what do you think consumers are not going to do after the pandemic is over? over? So a three-part question there, not to make it too complex. All right, let me see if I can I can break these down. Um, so yeah, I mean, stickiness is is really that means like what's what's the staying power of these decisions that, that customers have made. So we talk we've talked a lot about that, you know, in our company over the last several years. Is we're we're ramping up e-commerce. Customer might try it once or twice and you know because it's new technology and it's different there are there are things that people don't like you know substitutions is a huge challenge in e-commerce um so the the stickiness really refers to are people going to stick around after after things are back to normal so as we think about this in the covid context like everyone's wearing masks everyone's social distancing there's ordinances in a lot of different cities. So people are trying to limit exposure, meaning they're not trying to go to grocery stores because of this sort of exogenous factor of a pandemic. So as, as we're thinking about coming out of this, hopefully next year, um, we were wondering, you know, is, is the demand going to stay the same? Is the e-commerce penetration going to be the same? And, and I think we're, we're starting to see signs of, of yes, because one of the challenges with, with e-commerce has just been getting people to change their behavior just to even try it. Like, personally, I didn't ever use Hannaford to go, which is the you know local click and collect option where I live until the pandemic. I've worked for the company for many years, but I've never tried it because it was, it was a small barrier to entry. You know, I've got to create an account, then I've got to go figure out how to navigate the website. It's not hard, but it's just changing that mentality. And now that we've, we've done it, I can go on the app. I've got the same grocery list every, every week. I've got slots all allotted. It's way easier. It saves me a ton of time to go use that. So I think as we think about stickiness, it's just, can we get people in? And then can we continue to evolve the technology so that people stay in? And that's, that's sort of a, a big investment on our side as well, is that, you know, you get in and I think, you know, in, in an iPhone world, people are really used to rapid updates. You know, Facebook and Instagram are pushing new updates every month, if not more frequently than that. And now are we doing the same with our technology. So that's, that's really important is that sort of identify the gaps and switching from sort of the mentality of like a grocery store to a tech company is very different. And that's, that's been a big investment. We stood up a new entity called Peapod Digital Labs last year to help us with that transformation, because that's so important to be able to continue evolve, continually evolve the way that, that we're doing this. So I, I think that, you know, from a demand perspective, we're, we're seeing, People that, that order online, we're seeing you know, bigger orders less frequently. I think that's very much the, the case is that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do an order once every couple weeks, maybe, ideally, if, we have, if you have a big enough refrigerator, which we don't, but, you know, you're going you're gonna to order a lot less frequently and you're going to order a lot more. So it's, it's trying to figure out those demand patterns. You know, before I used to go to the grocery store almost every day. I wouldn't, I wouldn't plan as far in advance, but now those order volumes have shifted a lot. And then sort of the way to meet the customer on that, the what's available to promise when you're ordering online requires really different inventory strategies than what you see when you're in a store. Because you want to you wanna be able to show the customer what's available, but this is also a lot of this is next day pickup. So you don't necessarily know when you're when that pool of inventory can both service somebody in the store and somebody online in, in this sort of order online pickup in store model. It's hard to know exactly what what that means. So back to Ava's point around you know technology that you need a lot you need very strong predictive analytics to be able to say what's my inventory going to be tomorrow? What do I actually have to sell? And then you need sort of the technology component to say if this isn't available, what's the right substitution? And how do we interact with that customer to give him or her the right choice? I think that's sort of one of the challenges with e-commerce is if I'm in a store and products out of stock, I'm looking at all of my options immediately and I just grab something else. So that's a lot easier. But when you're online, 
is that really a decision that is that the customer's decision? Is that our decision? How do we make the right recommendation there? Um, so, so definitely sort of a technology component, the way that the, that the demand is, is a lot different. Um, even, even in store, you know, people are going much less frequently now. So the demand shape is, is considerably different than it was before. I know you asked three questions. I'm not sure if I hit all three. Uh, I think the, the last one you somewhat touch on, which is what people are not going to do post pandemic. Are they, you know, are they, you, and you kind of answer it, which is, are they going to rush back to the store? But it yeah. sounds like the, the demand, you expect the demand to continue. I think, I think we will probably see it ramp down potentially a little bit. I don't think it's going to be a full bounce back to where it was pre pandemic. Because, just because I think we've been challenged to deliver more innovative offerings and which, which is great. So it's not like, Hey, this is how it is now. This is how it was pre pandemic. You have order online, pick up in store. You have normal shopping now, because there's so much volume in e-commerce, we have to figure out other channels. So I think the offering is, is more appealing to customers and they've had the opportunity to try a bunch of different things. So I don't, I would be surprised if it goes back to, to normal levels at all. I think this is definitely here to stay. Right. Yeah, and super interesting about not just uh, the changing demand for how they're receiving the groceries, but also the increasing basket sizes and how that kind of affects the the demand planning and, and how you guys are evolving. And yes, I feel more passionate about my organic hummus when they're going to replace it than when I'm at the store and I have to replace it myself. Somehow that feels, you know, a little bit more stressful. Uh, but Ava, any comments to add there? Yeah, I agree with that. I think consumer demand will continue to evolve in an environment where there is more and more choices for consumers. And retailers need to offer this seamless experience, seamless journey to their customers through these different choices, through these different distribution channels. I think that some of the consumers that move into online grocery are going to stay there. And according to our HLAB MIT CTL survey, one third of these people that we survey, they, are, they said that they are going to stay with the new option. And I totally understand why. And um, to be honest, it's really convenient to receive your, your groceries at your door. Um, as online groceries uh, retailers are being able to provide more options to their customer faster and in this convenient way, I totally see this uh, demand growing and, and stay here. What I think is going to change after the pandemic is the um, kind of the um, pattern or the consumer behavior in terms of ordering uh, in a more rational way. What happened with the toilet paper, people were ordering more toilet paper than they, they need. So I, I believe that this is something that we're totally related with the pandemic. And as soon as this uh, happened, um, we are going to see more rational way to buy the, the things and the goods that customers need. So I think the bullwhip effect is going to be a little bit better <laughs> after the pandemic. Great. Thanks, Ava. But as you say that, I believe uh, toilet paper is disappearing, at least domestically here in the U.S. again. So <laughs> it's going to be it's uh, going to continue for the, the foreseeable future. But great insights there. Uh, let's just look at the uh, poll results real quickly before we move on to I just have one more question before we go to audience Q&A. So uh, if you haven't, we already have a, a quite a substantial list of questions. If you haven't already put in a question and you would like to, please do so now. I'll be scrolling through them soon. But on the poll results, uh, the question was, what are the key challenges that retailers are facing when uh, shaping their omni-channel strategy? And by and large, the the most selected one uh, answer was how to integrate online and offline online channels. So uh, both of you are both of you are very familiar with that, and and uh, uh, and obviously the challenge that it comes with that. The second most common was determining which distribution channel a retailer should offer, which I think is also very interesting in terms of industry and consumer demand. Any any thoughts on these results, real quickly, Dan and then Ava? Yeah, I th I think the I certainly agree that that's that's the biggest challenge because sort of back to the point I was making earlier is when you're you're ramping up e-commerce you sort of do it through existing infrastructure and then you get to the point where the demand is very significant like when you start you know you might have two percent of your your sales annually going through the e-commerce channel and when you when you grow substantially so it's a much bigger share of revenue you can't just sort of put it in through the same. Um, model. So, you know, order online, pick up in store, same pool of inventory, orders are sort of managed the same way. 
typical systems that that run that on the back end. And then as you start to ramp up that volume, you can't just have every customer going to pick a product in the store. You know, and some of some of our local stores here, you you go in and half the shoppers are shopping for online delivery. And is that necessarily the most efficient way? I mean, stores are not set up like warehouses. They're set up to have a sort of natural flow. So you walk by a bunch of different products and the way you merchandise is, is very much not optimized for selection. It's optimized for selling. So I think that as we, we see those, those sort of ramp up, it's you have to be able to scale into other methods. So if you have, you can't just continue to use a traditional brick and mortar store to do e-commerce fulfillment because that will quickly, you know, people won't want to be shopping in those stores anymore because everybody will be doing home delivery shopping and you'll have to fight with them for, for the product. And that's not, that's not the customer experience that we want to, we want to give. So where that makes sense, certainly continue to do that, but then figuring out what the alternative channels are. So that, that really goes into the second point is, you know, which distribution channels we want to offer and, you know, e-commerce is expensive. And I, th I think that's, everybody knows that it's like, we used to, customers used to go to our stores, pick product off of our shelves and drive it to their house for free. And now, that costs money to do that. And we're having to pay people to go select product, bring it to customers' houses. And that's something we're certainly willing to do. It's an experience that's really critical to the business. So it's figuring out what, what are the profitable channels and what are the channels that we want to meet customers at. Um, so there's, there's a lot of sort of trial and error in here right now. I think every, every big retailer is trying many different channels to find which, which have the most staying power, which ones can be profitable, which ones require a certain sort of scale to be profitable and certainly trying, trying many different ones. I don't think there's a silver bullet for this is the best way to do e-commerce grocery. It's, you know, different customer experiences are demanded in, in different markets. And we're sort of, sort of the nice part about our business is we're pretty big and we've got a bunch of different markets that we work in and we all sort of come together and figure out, you know, something that works in the Northeast might not work as well in the Southeast, but we have this scale where we can, we have the ability to pilot a bunch of different things and then sort of take the best of breed and, and try to scale that offering. Very interesting. Yeah. And learning how you're sort of choosing, selecting and, and piloting. Uh, Eva, quick, quick comments. Yes, regarding the first key challenge that the, they vote how to integrate the online and offline channels. This is something that even though those companies that were used to sell online, like Dell in the year 2000, they were doing that with a multi-channel approach. This means they were uh, selling uh, online, but with a completely independent channel, managing in a completely independent way. What is happening today is that these companies that are also offering online sales, they need to integrate both channels and take advantage of doing that. Um, we have been using here quantitative methods and mixing tier linear programming models just to help companies to redesign their network distribution in order to integrate and use stores, for instance, as a way to prepare online orders and ship online orders from the stores, in addition to also prepare in the e-fulfillment center or the distribution center. And doing that and integrating this offline and online channels, companies are um, obtaining some benefits from the logistics cost perspective. And also when they integrate the channels, they are able to reduce the lead time. That is another important aspect here. So I think this is one of the main challenges that companies are now, now trying to do, integrating, even though they were selling online for some years, they are now trying to use and take advantage of the integrating models. Great, thanks. Uh, so we'll just uh, go to one final question I have for you guys that I did see embedded in the q and but then we'll jump over to the q and A's because we have a lot of questions. Uh, so there's been broad skew rationalization as a result of the different demand and trying to respond to that. Uh, how uh, has that impacted ordering and inventory management? Uh, Dan, briefly on that. Yeah, so SKU rationalization means that, you know, we're manufacturers that used to make maybe 100 SKUs are now really only making, you know, 5, 10 in some cases, because it's a lot more efficient to run production lines when you don't have to switch them over. So from a, I think the, the biggest real impact here is from a demand management and merchandising perspective. So if we have historical sales on one item, but it's competing with 50 similar items, but now that 
that pool of competition for a specific item has shrunk to 10. Now we're going to sell a lot more of, of each one of those SKUs. So thinking about that from a forecasting perspective is quite challenging because we don't have historical information. So you know, the same volume of cereal might be sold, but now it's, now it's distributed amongst maybe 50 different types of cereal instead of 500. So how to plan for that from a forecasting perspective is, is really critical. It's, to be honest, skew rationalization really helps the supply chain, makes it a lot more efficient to move product through. It gives us more capacity because in a warehouse, you have to have sort of a storage and a select slot for each unique SKU. I mean, there's some, some other options there, but generally speaking, that's sort of how it works. So the fewer SKUs we have means the more capacity we can free up to bring in different products, to bring in more of specific products. So it's sort of a huge challenge from a demand management perspective, but it also it makes operations more efficient. Anything to add there, Eva? Yes, I fully agree with Dan observations and the importance of collaborating directly with the suppliers. Um, just wanted to also reinforce that inventory visibility is instrumental here. And also having an interorganizational information system that will allow retailers share important information with their suppliers and vice versa, suppliers with their retailers in real time. All of this is going to help with, uh, in order to offer this seamless experience that they need to offer to, to their customers. Also the variety of products that customers are demanding is increasing and warehouses need to store more and more diverse range of products. They need to shift from these bulk orders to individual items and at the same time they need to speed up the deliveries. And sometimes in some warehouses, this translates in a reduction of SKUs in order to be able to deliver these faster, faster orders. Um, finally, I think supply chain technology and systems is play a key role here. Has playing a key role in the past, but more specifically now that we need to offer this a variety of uh, small orders in a fast uh, in a fast time. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Ava. All right. So I'm going to launch our, our last poll uh, and we'll answer that towards the end of the session and we'll dig right into your questions right now. So this is a merged question and, and one for Dan, since we're fortunate to have you here. How has your uh, SEM master's experience and degree really helped you propel your career and any advice or very brief advice for some of the learners that are online that are pursuing either the micromasters or the, uh, or the masters? Yeah, it's, it's been great. It's been sort of the best career decision I ever made. I mean, I think I had found myself in a supply chain role and, you know, didn't have a supply chain background and spent two or three years sort of learning how my company did business and then realized that it, it would be very helpful to have an external perspective. So that, that's sort of what prompted me to do the MicroMasters in the first place. And it was great because it was everything I was learning, I could immediately apply to the work I was doing at that time. And it gave me a great external perspective. I, mean, I sort of, like I said, knew our business, but didn't know how this was done outside of the industry. So it was great because it, it, as I was thinking about sort of higher education, I was, it was like, do I do the do I study for the GMAT or do I go do the MicroMasters? And MicroMasters is immediately applicable, whereas a lot of the things you're going to learn in the GMAT, you're going to learn for the GMAT and then forget. So this was a great opportunity to sort of improve my ability to do my job and you know, sort of connect with, with this community. And then that led into the doing the, the full SCM program, which has built an incredible network of people throughout the world that I'm still connected with and, you know, connections with, with you and Ava as well are, are great. So I think from a, from a network perspective, it's an incredible way to get to know people globally and start thinking about different supply chain challenges. We still have a WhatsApp group from my class that is always going off with, with, people asking different questions. It's just a great network to connect with and sort of the education while being in a position that you can actually apply to your job is, is so valuable. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Uh, so let's, let's go to a question. So Frank says, uh, Dan, do you see grocery starting to incorporate Ava's showroom concept? For example, I prefer to shop produce and grocery, but I'd rather not purchase and carry bulk items home, paper towels, toilet paper. Do you see grocery offering some element of the showroom model where people can uh, in-store purchase and, and click by the phone to deliver to your home? 
So yeah, that's merging that's everything. Cool. Yeah, great question. I definitely know how you feel in the city carrying a bunch of toilet paper home. It's pretty annoying. So I, I I would certainly say that that's an option. You know, we're exploring a lot of different ways to reach our customer and the you know, endless aisle concept where you can go into stores. You know, if they don't have everything you want, you can have that delivered to your home. Different subscription models for you know bulky product is is something that you know is certainly not off the table. So I would say pretty much anything is is possible. You think about, um, you know, being able to go into a store, buy the product that you want immediately, and then have a subscription or, or be able to order it online and have that delivered right to your home. I, I certainly see that as an option in the future. Awesome. Uh, and since it was Ava's concept, I think we're looping her in her answer there. Um, so this is a question, and I think uh, Ava and I were just talking about it yesterday. Uh, can you talk a little bit about dark stores and uh, the other alternatives for uh, uh, picking, you know, as opposed to in-store? Uh, I'll let Ava start and then go to Dan. Sure. So dark stores is one of the models that uh, in particular in the grocery industry they are they are using. Dark store is um, is not a store in terms of the customers. They don't go to that store. In, in the dark store, we have pickers and the pickers are preparing online orders for the online customers. So it's a kind of a warehouse, but the layout has been designed and optimized for online pickers to prepare online orders. So the picker can prepare two, three, uh, two, three different online orders at the same time. Um, then deliver this uh, and ship these online orders from the dark store. Dark stores are typically closer to the customer, more closer than a distribution center, um, are able to deliver uh, to this area in the next day or in, even though in the same day delivery. Yeah, maybe I can, I can add a little bit to you know, some, some background on different concepts that we have. So sort of the traditional order online pickup and store, you've got selectors picking from the same pool of inventory as brick and mortar shoppers. We also have a, a wear room concept where we have two distinct pools of inventory in the same building. So we sort of have a mini warehouse in the back room that has separate inventory from our you know, brick and mortar store. We might supplement an order with a uh, product from the brick and mortar store, but we have two distinct pools of inventory. Uh, we can do home delivery from the wear room or we can do pickup and store with wear room inventory as well. And then sort of the step away from that is, is the dark store concept. So exactly like Ava said, it's optimized for selection, not optimized for selling, um, which is very different than traditional retail store. Then we can go even further to, you know, centralized micro fulfillment. You might have an automated solution that could be in place of a wear room or it could be a standalone building or doing automated fulfillment to go directly to customers from there. We have, you know, even a warehouse concept where we have warehouses near New York City that do e-commerce fulfillment right to that market from those warehouses. So there's, there's sort of scaling levels of, of um, different fulfillment options there. Awesome, thanks. Uh, and just real quick to add on to the to a LinkedIn uh, participant asked, can you explain the difference between a fulfillment center and a dark store? I think you touched on it briefly, but just for clarity. Yeah, so generally they can they can be the same. It's it's sort of interchangeable. Dark store is generally the concept of dark store generally means it's it's set up like a store. It's manual pick. It looks just like a store. It can be in the same box as a is an old closed store, but generally manually picked. Versus fulfillment center can be you know typical sort of warehouse. We we use the term fulfillment center generally meaning that we're going to fulfill customer orders going directly to the customer from a fulfillment center versus warehouse is sort of a general term where we might go to store. We might, um, we're not necessarily going straight to the customer from there. Awesome. Uh, so this is a good question from uh, Mazen. Uh, he asks, how are you dealing with regional lockdowns when it's sort of not a diffuse uh, kind of blanket demand, so pockets of changing demand and, and obviously different restrictions and things like that. So uh, just any thoughts there? Yeah, so it's, it's definitely uh, a challenge. I think, especially when the, there was a limit sort of at the beginning on the amount of customers in, in the stores, um, that certainly had an impact, but it's, it's all, I mean, we're custom, our company, everybody that works there is a customer of our stores. Like we're, we're, trying to do what's best by people and safety is the most important thing with all of this. So 
we need to get product to our customers. If they can't come shop in our stores, then we need to expand our, our home delivery option. We need to expand our, our click and collect option. So it is certainly split in terms of different geographies, but I think because of the way our company is, is structured, you know, we have stores from Maine to Georgia, but we have, there's five local brands that RBS supports, which each is really in tune with their, their local customers. So that's, that's sort of a nice part of our organization is that we're really close to, to the end customers and we're, we are ultimately the end customers as well. So safety is super important. I mean, thinking about how we get product to the customer is, is critical because fortunately, I mean, grocery stores have been allowed to continue like, to operate through all of this. And it's just a matter of how we get, how we get product and we'll meet the customer where they need to be met. Awesome. Super interesting. And definitely being categorized in the essential business, trying to serve all the customer's needs as you can. Uh, so I think this one's Ava and, and, and maybe a little bit me, but uh, what's the environmental impact of the e-grocery shift? Positive or negative? I'll let you start with that, Ava. <laughs> this is a great question. Definitely. If we move into e-commerce, we are going to deliver more products. And instead of having the customer going to the store, what we are having is a, a van or a vehicle delivering to your home. So in that sense, uh, we are increasing the number of deliveries and deliveries stop and the number of uh, trips for the van. Uh, we need to count here also if the customer is taking their own car to go to the store or if they are walking. So if they are taking their own car in that, in that sense, we can be even better if we, uh, if we optimize the route and we try to minimize the, the emissions when we are delivering. So it's definitely this depends on the habits of the customer, how they reach out to the supermarket. If we are comparing people walking to the supermarket versus more deliveries, of course, then CO2 emissions are going to increase. If we are comparing customers going with their car to their, to their store, then they, we have also opportunities to, to do a better job uh, optimizing the routes. So yeah, it's tricky, but definitely the number of deliveries are increasing. This is a reality. <laughs> yes, and, and also the famous, our, our famous question was, it depends. <laughs> so yes, it depends. The famous answer. <laughs> Um, so we have so many great questions. I think we're going to pop over to the poll and see if we have any uh, moments for a final question. But let's look at the poll number three. Uh, which supply chain areas will be impacted more by the growth of e-commerce? And so uh, the most uh, common answer was network design, uh, followed by inventory management, excuse me, followed by demand forecasting and then inventory management and distribution strategies. Any, any quick comments there for you both, uh, Dan? I mean, I, I think this is pretty telling because there's not a clear winner. This is going to impact everything. It's going to change the way we design our network, the way we manage inventory, the way we forecast demand, the way we distribute. I, I sort of agree here that there's not one area that's going to be more impacted than another. Everything is going to change. And it's all, we're already seeing the way that this is impacting the whole supply chain. Everything from strategic planning to tactical planning to day-to-day -day operations are impacted by this. Eva? I fully agree. We need to have an end-to-end -end supply chain uh, in order to be able to deliver this seamless experience. If we don't have that, this inventory visibility, the network design, the inventory management, according to that, we are not going to be able to provide this seamless experience to, to our customers. So yeah, fully agree. Great. <laughs> it's not just one area. <laughs> Awesome, thanks. And uh, we have 67 more questions. We didn't get through so many good questions. Uh, great uh, thoughts here. Um, so many familiar faces and all our great learners seeing Harsh on the line, Joel of France, and, and so many people. Thank you so much for joining. Ava, Dan, such great insights. Thank you for bringing all of it today and, and sharing everything with our learners and our community around the world. Yeah, thanks. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for all the great questions. Appreciate it. Thank you, Alexis. Great event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thanks, Dan. All right. Have a great rest of the day and, and think about e-grocery the next time uh, when you're thinking about your grocery shopping.